All right, so as you've heard, we are beginning our new series this morning, which basically we're going to be doing for the rest of this year. And what we are doing, if you haven't heard, is we are going to preach through the entirety of the Old Testament. So today we're going to preach the book of Genesis. Next week, the book of Exodus. Week after, the book of Leviticus. We're going to go one week for each book of the Old Testament. We're going to work our way right through. And the reason we're doing that, as you would know if you've been around a while, my preferred style of preaching is to go verse by verse and take my time. So when I preached the book of Genesis once, it took me two years. But the reason we're doing this is so you get a bigger picture feel of how the whole of the Old Testament ties together and how all of it is designed to reveal the coming of Christ. Okay, so that's why we're doing it, a big sweep, so we can see the full picture of how it reveals Jesus. So every week, we'll be looking at basically the same three major points, which is, what is its historical context? How does it fit into the historical picture? Your Bible is not in chronological order. Your Old Testament, I'm sure you might be aware of that. It's not written in a chronological sense. It's written according to genre. So we lump wisdom literature together and we lump historical together and we lump prophetic together. So we've got these kind of categories. So we're going to put it in its actual context as we go. We're going to look at its major themes of the book. What is it actually saying overall? And then lastly, how does it reveal Jesus? So that's what we're going to be doing for the rest of this year pretty much. I hope my prayer is by the time we hit Malachi... Everyone in the church who's a regular is going to be able to be of no doubt, 100% assurance that the Old Testament absolutely brings you to Jesus Christ. Okay, that's my prayer, that the Old Testament brings us to Jesus Christ. Now to begin with, as I said, we're starting in Genesis. A few years back, I was at the Acts 29 International Conference called the Global Gathering. And at that time in America, they had a a time of really, really high racial tension. So I don't know if you remember, uh, years ago, I think there had been a black man who may have been uh, shot by police uh, unarmed, and then there was a retaliation that was occurring. And while we were in Texas, uh, one of those shootings occurred where there was some uh, black men who got sniper rifles and were shooting cops. Do you remember when all this went down? It was a pretty, pretty tense terrible time over there. Uh, And so we happened to be over in America during that time. And then at the Acts 29 conference, Matt Chandler invited uh, a series of black pastors up on stage from America. uh, And they all just shared about their experiences in growing up uh, in North America and where they had encountered racism and stuff. And it was this really powerful time of just pastors gathered together uh, before the Lord and just seeking unity in Christ. It was, a, it was a really great time. It was an emotional time. While outside there was so much horrible stuff happening, but there there was this genuine seeking of reconciliation in Christ. Now, one of the things that struck me, which I'd never thought about before, is each of these men said one after another, we only have a history to a point. And you kind of think, what do you mean? And they, all of their genealogies stop as soon as their ancestors were put on a slave ship. So slavers didn't take records of genealogies for them, right? So all of them, they can only trace back to a certain point within America, but no one can go beyond that to know their genealogy. And it kind of struck me, I thought... It's really incredible, isn't it, that no one has this kind of deeper background that they can look back in. And you can sort of sense the pain of it. Because origins tell a story, don't they? Your history tells a story. There's a reason that every single day, I think this is just in the Western world, there are over 300,000 searches on genealogy and ancestry. Every day, at least 300,000 people are online trying to uncover their roots because our roots give us some history. They give us a story. In a sense, they help us know who we are. 
So the book of Genesis, what does the word Genesis mean? It means simply origin. That's what it means. It's the beginning. The book is the story of all of our origins. Black, white, any other color that we all are, any nationality that we are, doesn't matter. The book of Genesis is all of our origin, isn't it? That's what makes it so incredibly rich. Many people around the world, not just in North America, many people around the world struggle to trace their history back. But here in the book of Genesis, we have the only origin story that truly counts. The most important story, the story that reveals who we truly are, the story that answers the existential question, why am I here, is found in the book of Genesis. It's an important, incredible book for us to look at together. So, here we go. Here's a very rough breakdown for you on the book of Genesis. It's written in two parts. That's it. 1 to 11 of the book of Genesis is written about the history of the whole universe and the history of us as humanity. Chapter 12 to the end is the history of one man, Abram, and the nation of Israel. That's the book of Genesis. 1 to 11 is the history of all of humanity. 12 to 50 is the story of God's chosen people. So that is the book of Genesis. So the first two chapters of the book cannot be over-esteemed by us because the first two chapters of Genesis reveal so much truth and answer all of those questions about who we really are. Steve shared it this morning, but in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's amazing right there, isn't it? How much truth in the world is unraveled by that particular statement? God created the heavens and the earth. God is eternal. He has no beginning. Isn't this fun to try and get your head around? Does anyone ever think about this and your brain just wants to go pop, can't deal with it? God never began. He's always been God. Everything else in all of existence has its beginning in God. He has no beginning. He has always existed. Think back a trillion, billion, infinite years, there is God. Look forward in infinite years, there is God. Look to the ends of the universe and there is God. He is infinite. And he created the heavens and the earth because he is the only infinite one. Man, how amazing. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is why when Moses says, what shall I tell him your name is? What's God's response? Anyone? Come on. I am. I am. In other words, I am eternal. I am before time began. I am when time finishes. I am is his name. In the beginning, I am was there and he created everything. And that is so amazing for us to know. Yeah, as a Christian, I have to constantly read on social media my non-Christian friends' memes, which pay out Christianity. Uh, I'm friends with a lot of atheists, etc., and they, you know, they constantly put things up there which ridicule and mock Christianity and and I'm okay with that. They don't know Jesus, so sometimes I get a chuckle out of them. Um, and I sit there and I read that. But the one that gets me is they're always paying out on any Christian who believes in creation. The thing I find a bit rich about that is this. I say there is the ever-eternal existent God who spoke things into being, and they're like, that's ridiculous. Nothing exploded into everything, and that's how we got here. I'm like, okay, look. I can't prove to you, and I can't, can I, that God created the heavens and the earth. I can't prove that, can I? There's no way I can, like, recreate that in a lab. Likewise, you can't prove to me, unless you're going to show me something pretty amazing right now, that nothing exploded into everything. How ridiculous. Right? So what we learn right here at the start is that there is 
God and he is transcendent. He is above. He is all-powerful and he created you. He created all things and he says in Genesis that his creation is good. But only of people does he say his creation is very good. His creation is good, but only of man does he say it is very good because man is created in God's image. Make no mistake, in this messed up world that wants to turn everything on its head, a tree is not equal to a person. A dog and a cat, and I don't care how much you love them, is not equal to the vilest person on earth because they were not made in God's image, but the vilest person on earth was. Animals and trees and plants and rivers and streams are not the equal of humanity because only man bears the image of God. We've got to get that fundamentally right in a world that wants to reject the truth. So in Genesis, we see that God is eternal and powerful, that we are created and loved and given responsibility and purpose as God's rulers over creation under him. It's simply not true that we are a random atoms grouped together in a primordial swamp lottery, right? That's the evolutionary standard. There's a bunch of cells in a swamp and... Some of them jumbled together and, you know, out popped James. Um, right, there you go, right? That, that's the evolutionary model. We're not a swamp lottery. You are loved and created by God. All of humanity is of inherent value and worth as God's image bearers. All of humanity, every race, every nationality, all people are of inherent value and worth as God's image bearers. I'll tell you how that plays out throughout history. The Western world has largely accepted that as being true. Who started free education in the Western world? Christians, the church. Who started free health care in the Western world? The church. Who started charity in the Western world? The church. Who created democratic, democratic government in the Western world? The church. Anyone starting to see where that comes from? Because if we believe all people are created by God and are of inherent worth, dignity, and value, then we fight for the rights of all people, don't we? And so that has played out in Christian hearts throughout history as they have fought for and won care for people, right? The church, believing that all people are of inherent value as God's image bearers. So what went wrong? We've got this beautiful picture of who our creator is and we've got this incredible picture of the loving creation that he gave us in Genesis 1 and 2 and of course we hit Genesis chapter 3. What is Genesis chapter 3? Genesis chapter 3 is humanity deciding that their desires matter more than God's. Ultimately, isn't that behind every sin? When you decide that something you want means more to you than what God desires. It's behind every sin, every murder, every act of cruelty, every war ultimately boils down to somebody has a desire that they put above God and the rest of humanity. Every sinful act, even just in your home this morning before you came to church, boils down to you had a desire that you wanted to put ahead of God and ahead of your family and therefore you acted in a way that harmed others, right? Every sinful act has selfish desire at its cause. In Genesis 3, we handed over, God hands humanity over to our sinful desires. And the world that we see is the result of that human desire. 
Church, I want you to really, really grasp this. This is what Genesis teaches us together this morning. It's the opposite of what the world says. The world says what? Follow your desires. Follow the dreams of your heart. You were never created to follow your desires. You were created to follow God and his desires. The human heart is corrupt and deceitful above all things. And a world that says follow your desires is a world that is quickly headed into death and ruin. Now you were created to follow God and his desires. And because we do not, there is sorrow and suffering in the world. You are created to put your faith in God. And so this is the book of Genesis 1 and 2. We have this incredible picture of our creator, this amazing story of who he is. And then we get to Genesis 3 and we have the fall of man. What happens in Genesis 4, anyone? The first what? Murder. Brother against brother. Gee, it doesn't take long, does it? doesn't take long for humanity to follow their own heart and where's their own heart lead them to murder by genesis 6 we have the flood and what we have in genesis 6 is the depravity of man has grown so fast in genesis 6 verse 5 we read god say that every intent every intention of man is only evil all of the time wow Genesis 3, they eat of the tree and make no mistake, what happens? God hands them over to a depraved mind. Whose mind? Whose depraved mind? Our depraved mind. Humanity's depraved mind. By Genesis 6, every intention of man is only evil all of the time. Apart from God, evil will reign. And so we see in the first 11 chapters who God is, who we were created to be, but also who we truly are, separated from God, slaves to our own sinful desires. That is the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. In chapter 12, we take a slight turn. It starts with a man named Abram who will later have his name changed to Abraham, and from him will come the nation of Israel. Why him? Ever think about that? Why Abraham? God chose him. That's the only answer, right? God chose him. God picked him among all people on earth, and it comes down to God's sovereign choice. But what we do know is Abraham was chosen for God to give a blessing to whom? Everyone, all people on earth. Abraham was chosen not to pile blessings upon Israel as a nation, but Israel as a nation was to be a light to the world that they were to present the way of salvation to the world and all people would be blessed through them, not just with the coming of Christ, but they were meant to bring in the foreigner and bring them to God. However, the nation of Israel failed because ultimately they wanted to keep the blessing of God to themselves because we follow our sinful and depraved hearts. We've got God, you don't. Right? That was the nation of Israel. So Genesis ends with the people of God, Israel, going to Egypt to secure their safety in a time of famine. And all of this was brought about by the hand of God who had placed Joseph already in Egypt in order to save, only God can save people. By God's hand, Joseph is in the very place needed to bring salvation to Israel. Joseph foreshadows the coming of Christ. Jesus, who is God, who is equal with God, but came in the flesh to redeem us from our sins. So how does Genesis point us to Jesus. I'm going to open up to John chapter 5, Gospel of John chapter 5. If you have your Bible, you can open up with me. 
John 5, and we're going to look at 46 to 47. John 5, 46 to 47. Jesus speaking, okay? Listen to this. This is the words of Christ. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Who was Moses writing about when he was writing Genesis, when he was writing the story of creation, when he was writing all of that? He was writing about Christ, who is God. The words are about Jesus. So we have this incredible picture of who Christ is right there in the book of Genesis. And Genesis reveals the corruption of humanity, and Genesis reveals that we need a Savior. Genesis reveals that there must be a penalty for sin. There must be a sacrifice to atone for sin. That we are lawbreakers and we can't do it ourselves. So let's look at some of these passages. I'll bounce through fairly quick that show us who Jesus is. Genesis 3.15, and Steve, you guessed correctly. Of course, I'll look at Genesis 3.15 because Genesis 3.15 is the first promise of our Saviour. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Right? Genesis 3.15, one day will come from the offspring of woman, the one who will crush the head of Satan. Jesus came and conquered sin and death. He now sits at the right hand of the Father and he will rule forevermore. The first promise right there in Genesis 3, 15. Something else we learn about the coming of Christ comes early on in Genesis 3, 21, where we read, And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. The first death in the book of Genesis is when God kills an animal in order to cover the shame of Adam and Eve. Right here in Genesis 3.21, we have the first death in order to cover for sin, to atone for sin. Again, it points at the fact that there is going to need to be a sacrifice once and for all, which will pay the penalty of sin. And right here in Genesis 3.21, we get the first picture. To see that in its fullness, again, like I said, we're going to bounce through a few scriptures. I'm just going to quickly open up to the book of Hebrews and look at Hebrews 10.3-4. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. You know, some of us at the moment are trying to read through the full Old Testament this year. While we're preaching through it, a few of us have taken on the challenge that we're trying to read the whole of the Old Testament. Uh, And so not long ago, I finished reading through the book of Leviticus. The book of Leviticus is about all of the laws, and it spends great detail talking about the sacrifices. And I tell you what, it blows your mind. I cannot get my head around how much blood was flowing through that temple. You're talking like a million people and all of them are constantly bringing oxes and and goats and pigeons and all kinds of things to have their throat cut and blood spilled. And that's what it's saying here in Hebrews. What does that constant pouring out of blood tell you? That you are sinful. It doesn't... I mean, in this sense, it says your sin will be atoned for, but it doesn't, in one sense, it doesn't do that because you know you're coming back the next day to do it all over again. Oops, I touched something I wasn't meant to touch. I've got to go do another one. I touched somebody I wasn't meant to touch. I've got to go do another one. There's this constant shedding of blood which tells you what? That you are a sinner and you are not right with God. 
And so something dies to pay the penalty of your sin. And as its life fades out in front of you, it says that is what should happen to you. That is what's meant to happen to you. For the penalty of sin is death. And this ox stands in your place for a day, for a year, but it's coming. And then we go to Hebrews 10, same chapter, verses 11 to 12, when we read this, and every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. The final sacrifice, Christ willingly gave up his life for you and paid the penalty that you deserve and paid the penalty of your sin and he bore it on the cross so that you have life in his name, you have been given his righteousness and because of the finished work of Christ, you have eternal life and it is guaranteed and can never be taken from you. No more sacrifices ever required. Christ finished it on the cross. Do we get that, church? I can't understand why people aren't just yelling out, Amen, hallelujah, preach it, brother. Like, get excited. Man, you almost see a brother dance in here. Like, yeah, thank you. How good is that? That is what the, the picture of Scripture tells us. No more sacrifice required because Jesus was the final sacrifice. And so we also get to Genesis and now we understand why in Genesis 12, 3, it is promised to Abraham that all people on earth will be blessed through him. Why is that so? Because from the line of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, from that line is born Jesus. Jesus, the saviour of all of mankind. Jesus, the hope of the world, comes through the line of Abraham. And how cool is that all found in the book of Genesis? Going to open up to Genesis 49.10. Right, right at the end of Genesis. Jesus comes from the line of Judah. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. The scepter will never depart from Judah, and from the line of Judah comes Christ. In fulfillment of all those Old Testament prophecies, to pay the sacrifice and penalty of our sin, Christ the Messiah. So Genesis tells us our origin. It tells us we are created by Almighty God and that He cares for us. It tells us that due to sin and disobedience, we broke our relationship with God and plunged the world into chaos. But Genesis also begins right there in chapter 3 to say that the Saviour is coming. The one who will crush Satan's head. And Jesus does all of these things. So in closing, what does that mean? It means that ultimately we have to have our faith in Christ. But we don't do so without reason. There is a lot of proof that supports Jesus being who he says he is. God in the flesh, the saviour of mankind. It means you can build your faith on the knowledge of God so that when trouble comes, you won't be knocked down. Build your faith on the knowledge of the truth of God's word and you will stand in the day of trouble. And finally, and most importantly, it tells us that Jesus is God's only plan of salvation. That God so loved you that he sent his son to die on the cross and pay the penalty of your 
sin. If you put your faith in him, you will have life evermore. That you can have a relationship of joy with God, a relationship of peace with God, because you have been given the grace of the sacrifice of Jesus. Genesis tells you that you are a sinner. And Genesis tells you that Jesus is the Savior. And how good it is to have the promises of God. Just really quickly, just in finishing off, I went down uh, to Brisbane on Thursday night and saw Rend Collective live. Everyone know the band Ren Collective? Yeah, there's a few people out there going, oh, really? Yeah, I've been rubbing it into all the other young adults who wanted to go but didn't get tickets. So, suckers. Uh, anyway, so I went and saw Ren Collective live. And I tell you, it was great. They were so centered on Jesus the whole time. They preached a gospel message. People responded and came to faith that night. Like it was fully centered on Christ. Uh, And they kept talking the whole time, though, about how uh, joy in Christ helps overcome obstacles in life. They're saying that gospel doesn't promise a life without struggle, but it does promise a God who will be with you and who will bring you into eternity. It was a really good concept. And then right towards the end, the lights went out. It was pitch black. They came back on, and every member in the band, there's six of them, had a giant panda head on. And they played the whole song with giant panda heads on. And you were kind of sitting there going, that's random. Uh, And then the lights went off, and then they came back on, and the panda heads were gone. Anyway, the lead singer stops, and he goes, okay, we're just going to deal with this now so I don't get endless... Uh, Facebook messengers, why panda heads? He said, guess what? Seriousness is not a fruit of the Spirit. He said, joy is a fruit of the Spirit. Right? He goes, fun is a part of Christianity. We should have a good time. And he said, and I hope you had a laugh when we did that. And I hope it was fun for you. And he said, but always remember, as much as we have a laugh, the reason I'm kind of explaining this to you is when you walk out the door, the thing I want you to remember most is joy comes from Christ. It's really good, but it was just, you know, it was fun at point at Christ. So Genesis paints a bleak picture of our sin. But it also paints the hope of our Savior in Christ and the joy that he should bring, knowing your salvation has been won in Christ. Let's pray.